The first point to notice is that for the United States to contend with a financial crisis on this scale is fiscally possible. That is to say that even a $2 trillion deficit, let's assume the worst, the largest imaginable deficit in peacetime next year to finance not only the bailout but also an enormous stimulus package. This can be financed, it seems to me, because the debt-to-GDP ratio of the United States is by no means the highest in the world as things stand. Uh, if you include only that uh, debt which is in public hands as opposed to in the hands of government agencies, it's still less than 50% of GDP. And an addition of another, let's say, 10% of GDP is conceivably affordable. It's affordable, though there's a caveat. Assuming the rest of the world is willing to absorb a continued, indeed accelerated, issuance of American government debt. The second, <clears throat> and in, in many ways crucial point, is that it's all relative. It's relatively easier for the United States to finance this kind of a deficit than it is for European countries. And what is not generally acknowledged here or in Europe is that the crisis is worse for Europe than for the United States. Why is that? Well, first, it's because the banking problems that we've seen in this country are mirrored on the other side of the Atlantic. Indeed, leverage is higher in many European countries' banking systems than it is here, much higher in the case, for example, of Germany. It comes as something of a surprise to realize the extent to which the Europeans currently pointing fingers at the United States have been guilty of exactly the same excesses in their financial markets as went on here. And indeed, in a country like Britain, the degree of imbalance between finance and the rest of the economy is far, far greater than here. It has to be said, and I apologize to any of my countrymen and countrywomen here, that from a purely financial point of view, Great Britain is, is close to being Great Iceland. <laughs> the Icelandic story of an excessively large financial system in relation to an underlying economy is in fact quite closely paralleled, but on a larger scale in the United Kingdom at this point. Switzerland too has an Icelandic character, an enormous financial system relative to the underlying economy. And it's much harder for the Europeans to contend with this crisis because not only are these uh, very large financial systems uh, in arguably worse shape than the American banking system, there is also no European treasury that can finance a $700 billion bailout. Right now, each European country is having to tackle its financial crisis on its own. National treasuries, national financial ministries are coping with this crisis, or rather, not coping with this crisis. So that's the second point. It's not really appreciated how big a problem this is for the Eurozone and indeed for the wider European Union. The third point is that those famous BRICs, Brazil, Russia, India, China, turn out to have been aptly named because they are dropping like BRICs. If you look at equity markets, although it's unquestionably the case that this is one of the worst bear markets in the United States in living memory, the stock exchanges of the BRICs have fallen twice as far as the S&P 500 in the year to date, uh, with Russia the worst performer and China and India not far behind. That's important because it seems to me to cast fundamental doubt on the plausibility of the decoupling hypothesis. Now, I always find that word decoupling faintly obscene, but that's possibly because I have a puerile mind. But let's simply assume uh, the, the, the thesis that China can walk away from this financial crisis unscathed and continue to maintain a growth rate of at least 6 or 7%. That is the hypothesis of the Great Reconvergence. I'm not persuaded. I'm not persuaded that China is so much less dependent on export markets than it was, say, 10 years ago. Many of the calculations that imply that seem to me to be based on official estimates of the importance of net exports that aren't wholly plausible. The BRICs are dropping, in other words. It's by no means certain that they can avoid a kind of asymmetric shock as the export markets of the developed world suddenly contract. My fourth point is that the great crisis is terrible news for the petro powers. Remember, some of the biggest thorns in the side of the United States are energy exporters, Russia, 
Venezuela, and of course Iran. The great credit crunch spells the end of the commodity price boom that peaked uh, in the early part of this year. And as the price uh, of natural gas, and particularly of oil, uh, zooms downwards, I think quite likely to below $50 a barrel, maybe to as low as $25 a barrel, it's game over for the petropowers. It doesn't take much for Venezuela's financial system to teeter on the brink. In fact, as soon as oil fell below $95 a barrel, uh, the finances of Venezuela began to look very problematic. For the other petropowers, the price uh, barrier is a little lower, but not that much lower. Again, it's all relative. It's all relative, but in the end, the relative shock of a great recession, if not a great depression, is greater for energy exporters than for the energy importers, who in fact get a kind of stimulus, a kind of tax cut at the gasoline pump.